Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. I haven't said hello to you yet. Good morning. Good to see you all. Um, it's been a crazy weekend so far. I don't think Alec has actually gone home from St. Thomas's so far. He seems to, seems to have been here all the time. We had a, uh, I think most of you know, we had a baptism by immersion yesterday here which we understand to be the first in St. Thomas's, well, the one we, first that we know of anyway. So, uh, and uh, it was a great day. We had a, believe it or not, there was a, a swimming pool down the bottom there yesterday, uh, which the curate and I and Sue, who got baptised, climbed into, and uh, we baptised her. So, uh, I'm sure the photos will appear in next month's magazine. You can check them out there, but I've got some with me I can show you earlier on. So... Uh, Great time. And again, we've got two baptisms today, not by immersion this time, just for the more normal route through the font this time. But, um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it, it's particularly about this church venue, actually. I think God seems to be really blessing um, the life events. So the, you know, the marriages, uh, the funerals uh, and the baptisms. He seems to, with the attitude of the congregation here, um, and our desire to reach out to young families. He seems to be really blessing this place right now in terms of that. St Nick's as well, of course, but actually when people look to Bedhampton Church, the thing that comes to mind is this building here, isn't it? Um, so uh, thank you so much for all that you do to make people feel welcome as they come in. And that wasn't even the sermon. <laughs> We're going to worship our God this morning, so let's take a moment just to uh, prepare ourselves. Put, a while, put aside the worries of the week for a moment. The Lord direct our thoughts and teach us to pray. Lift our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we're going to sing our first hymn of worship, number 57. Uh, as you can see, there's a, you know, a selection of verses there that we're going to sing, but one, five, seven, and eight. So if we turn to number 57, and let's sing to our Lord. Stand if you're able to, please.
Do have a seat. In a moment I shall, as usual, pray the collect, the prayer of the week. Um, but we've got this tradition here of just leaving some space before the collect, haven't we? Um, for you to say your own prayer of thanks in silence. So let's do that right now. God of constant mercy, who sent your Son to save us, remind us of your goodness, increase your grace within us, that our thankfulness may grow, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, Nigel's going to come and read to you a whole book, well almost a whole book of the Bible. The reading this morning is taken from Philemon, beginning at verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. To Aphia, our sister. To Archibus, our fellow soldier. And to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith, so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favour you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done anything wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write knowing that you will do even more than I ask. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I shall uh, reflect on that a little bit later, but it's quite interesting to hear about a slave in, in one of our Bible readings, isn't it? And I won't cover that later on, but it's helpful to understand, um, actually, that when we think of slave in the Bible, it isn't necessarily what we think of as a slave today. There was no, um, there was no economic way of debt being got rid of 
in the, in those times. And so, probably in this case, and particularly in this case, um, Onesimus is probably someone who had a great debt to to the rich man Philemon, um, and that's probably the way that he uh, was working off his debt. So, uh, so we can maybe that, maybe that's a subject matter for another time. Slavery in the Bible that might be a good. Uh, to look at, might it? But it'd be helpful for you to understand that now, just so as we reflect later, you don't think I'm ignore, ignoring the elephant in the room. Oh. Let's turn uh, to our hymn books again, and number 91, uh, which is uh, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You, and let's stand to sing to our Lord if we're able to. Do have a seat. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, beginning at chapter 14, verse 25. Large crowds were travelling with Jesus and turning up to him said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and child, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and you're not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you. Saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't you first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not 
give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to Christ. So Father, as we uh, come to look at these readings, we pray that, uh, that our minds and hearts will be open to you. Would you take my preparation and use it for your glory? Might we know your kingdom here? Amen. What's the least I have to do to enter the kingdom of heaven? That's what jumped out to me. I know those words aren't in that gospel message, but when I read, read that, that is what jumped out to me. What's the minimum I can get away with and still enter the kingdom of heaven? That's, it's almost like Jesus has got to this point and had enough. He's in the middle of, of a great teaching block where he's been, uh, in Luke, where he's been talking about what it means to be a follower of Christ what it means to see God's kingdom come. And it's almost like he gets to this point and he's like, you just, you just don't get it, do you? Because they've all been asking these questions. They've been saying, okay, well, what about this? And what about that? And do we have to do this bit over here? And do we have to knock the board off the wall? <laughs> do we have to do that bit over there? And you, I can almost feel the frustration in Jesus, like, you just don't get it, do you? Actually, you can't earn your way to the love of God. He loves you already. That is impossible. And it's almost like they're standing there going, Jesus, what's the, the least we have to do? But really, actually, a worthy response is to simply love God and love others. That's what we read elsewhere, isn't it? That's what Jesus is really saying. It's actually, you can't earn your way. You've got to just, the response of knowing that you can't earn your way and it's been paid is to love God and love others. And then he sort of carries on teaching for the rest, rest of Luke as though he's just put that one to bed now and that's done and dealt with. And then we come to our epistle, our New Testament reading that Nigel read. And through the quirkiness of the Anglican lecture, we find these two books together. Philemon is, um, like I say, to call it a book is probably stretching it a bit really, isn't it? It's more of a note, really. 21 verses, one chapter, 471 words in my English translation I worked out. But it is a worthy note to read as we see Paul respond to a fellow Christian. The Christian theologian Lawrence Richards writes this, he says this about Philemon. He says, Paul's letter was written to beg a wealthy believer named Philemon to take back a runaway slave, Onesimus, without punishing him as harshly as the law permitted. The runaway slave met Paul while the apostle was in prison. He talked about him being an old man in the arena, didn't he? Paul's appeal suggests that Onesimus may have robbed his master for funds to make his getaway. Yet Paul describes Onesimus as faithful and as a brother. Apparently Paul led the runaway slave to Jesus and Onesimus has shown evidence that that was a real conversion. After his conversion, Onesimus has spent enough time with Paul for Paul to say that he was helpful and to love him. When you know that sort of information, you can go home and read Philemon with a different perspective, can't you? When you read Philemon, I'd encourage you to do so as you saw it. It takes a couple of minutes to read over a cup of tea this afternoon. But when you read it with a knowledge of what's going on there, that actually it's an interaction between Paul as a church leader, bishop if you will, and, and Philemon who is a rich fellow Christian, you see actually grace beginning to abound in Paul's letter. When you read those words understanding that Paul has the authority to just tell Philemon what to do, as if the bishop was to walk in today and say, Max, Get down, I'm preaching, you're not. And yet, Paul's gracious approach is to let Philemon make that decision for himself. You see, Paul demonstrate what Jesus was speaking of in the gospel. In his interaction, you see him sort of almost say, even though I disagree with the way Philemon would approach this, how much can I love him? How much can I love him and allow him 
to move forward with the grace of God. Charge it to me, Paul says. Charge it to me. Whatever you feel you are owed, charge it to me. Whatever you feel, wherever you feel you are wrong, charge it to me. Does that sound a little familiar? When Jesus was on the cross, hanging there for you and I with our sins uh, on his back and in his hands, he turned to Father God and said, charge it to me. Paul is demonstrating a response that says, here is the whole of my life. Here is my response to your love. What is the most that I can do to love God and love people? Charge it to me. Paul is modelling Jesus. It's been a busy week, and if I'm honest, I, I wrote this yesterday, which is unusual for me. But as I sat there yesterday, hoping that I'd already had a, ser a sermon somewhere about this that you hadn't heard from me, I had to re realise that there was, a, there was a message in this for me as well as for you. I felt that revelation on my shoulders. And I had to turn to Father God and say, where do I need to say, charge it to me? Where do I need to say, what's the most that I can do to love this fellow Christian that perhaps I disagree with? And so you know what's coming, my friends. Where have you responded to a brother or a sister in Christ? where actually you could have simply loved them and turned to God and said, charge it to me. Where have you been perfectly within your rights to respond to someone with something less than love? But now God is calling you to model Jesus. What situation floats through your mind right now through the spirit? What face comes to mind through the spirit? What is the most you can do to love God and love others? My friends, I love you, but where do you need to say, charge it to me? We're going to, as the children gurgle and smile and remind us of the fun and love that we can have in church, we're going to be quiet as we can for a while. Don't worry about the kiddies, they're fine. We can cope with that. But I just want you to reflect as I reflect on that message of charge it to me. For those of us who have work to do coming out of this message this morning, let us all turn to our response on our sheet. And no one will love. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. You have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. 
and Christ shall give you life. When Christ our life appears, you will appear with him in glory. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you life. And knowing that when we turn to the light, we are forgiven, let us say together the prayers of penance. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit with us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so may the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And having been forgiven, we turn to 834 in our hymn books. And we sing to our Lord, our glorious Lord, once more. Just stand if we're able to. Do have a seat as Linda brings us our prayers for the week. Let us come humbly before our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day when we can come freely to worship you. Thank you that throughout our land, people are meeting together 
to hear your word proclaimed and to praise you in song. We praise you, Lord, for the truth of the gospel going forth here in our own parish through preaching, home groups, Alpha and Messy Church. May the spiritual seeds that are being sown bear much fruit as we see you working in the lives of those who are seeking to know Jesus as Saviour. Now, dear Lord, as we look at our world, there is so much cause for despair. We see the awful effects of flooding in Pakistan. Thousands of men, women and children left destitute after the loss of their homes and so many lives lost. Lord, you see and you care, for you are a God of compassion and hope. Please, dear Lord, help these dear people and all who are, prov who are providing aid for them. We remember again the people of Ukraine. Please, Lord, let there be an end to this senseless war, so many families bereft and grieving. May your strong hand of comfort and help be upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we bring before you the person who will be announced as our new Prime Minister tomorrow, as they and the government face the enormous challenges that lie ahead. We ask, please, that people with godly wisdom will help direct their path and that they too will turn to you for help as they guide us through these troubled times. So many people are anxious and afraid just now as to how they will manage with the soaring cost of energy prices and the cost of living rising weekly. Lord, you who know all things, please come to our aid. May there be a spiritual awakening, a turning to you, and instead of fear gripping our land, may your peace reign as we look to you. You are our strength, our hope. You are a faithful God. May our confidence remain strong in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Father, we pray now for those in our own parish who are unwell at this time. We bring before you all who are suffering physically and those who are struggling with mental health. We name those on our weekly sheet who have asked for prayer. We think of Peter, Elaine Newman, Janice Stott, Amelia, Michael, Marjorie, Anne, Valerie and Eric, Claire, Richard, Malcolm, Mike, Margaret Harkham, Kerry, Kirsty and Donna. And also we remember those before you who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We especially think of Eunice's family as they, um, as they said goodbye to their, their, dear, their dear, dear family this week, Lord. Just bless them and help them to know your presence and your comfort with them. May each one who have lost loved ones over recent years sense your loving and covered, com comforting presence with them day by day. And in a quiet moment, we ask your help and blessing upon those on our own hearts. Dear Lord, whatever challenges or difficulty we are facing in the days ahead, may we be reminded of your words, peace be with you. And may our confidence and trust in you shine out from our lives as a witness to those we love and to the people of our parish. Merciful Father, accept these, these prayers, prayers for the, for the sake, sake of your, your Son, Son, our, our Saviour, Saviour Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. And we bring those prayers and the prayers of our hearts together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, as we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So you've got your new sheet, so I won't repeat everything that's in the new sheet, other than to say um, 
Alpha started uh, this last Thursday, uh, which is the course that we run where people can come and ask questions um, about who Jesus is and, and chat with that and have some food together. Um, and we've got, a, we've got a good number coming along, got some people we weren't expecting coming along, so that was always fun. But the food miraculously went, every, went uh, enough. Um, probably uh, not too late if you know anyone who wants to join us this Thursday, just uh, probably the last week where it's worth joining us this Thursday, but not too late for that if you let me know. Um, and other than that, if you are someone who looks at the rotors uh, and you've received the October rotor, uh, in October, we were going to have the Archdeacon come and we were going to have a joint service. Unfortunately, she's got some family commitments that have now come up, so she won't be joining us in October. The result of which is that the October rotor got juggled up uh, around again. I'll ask Deb to send it out once more, uh, but you can look at it online if you need to. So, uh, Right, I think that's all I've got in the way of news. So uh, we're going to turn to our hymn books one last time. Number 205, um, from heaven you came. Let's stand if we're able to. <laughs>
be good to share tea or coffee with you in a moment, but for now, the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. So let's share together the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.